the dirty secrets behind wind power. Wind turbines will devastate a community. All the arguments for the Green Energy Act turned out to be phony. The largest scam we have ever heard. How a liberal green dream turned into a nightmare. We tried so hard to stop what happened to us. What on earth is happening? My God, what are you people thinking? The hidden victims. We wanted to protect our families. It's like ripping my heart out. The mysterious health problems. Severe migraines, severe depression. I have heart attacks sometimes. Lives turned upside down. How dare they make me leave my home? We have a government that's not protecting their citizens. Their rights stomped on. They took away their planning powers. In the mad dash to ramp up wind power. Why the push and why the rush? The Green Energy Act just allows for areas to be obliterated by turbines. The rise of a rural backlash. This is our fight, this is our community against a green-obsessed government. They all sat down with Environmental Defense, David Suzuki Foundation. This is not green. It's ridiculous. The massive cost. They don't run on wind. They run on subsidies. So much money has been spilled here. For a system that doesn't make any sense. It is not profitable. It's not cost-effective. The inside connections. The wind turbine companies are side by side with the Liberal government. We are not going to hold us full as cancel those contracts. Will they turn back? Too much invested to admit the error. Who thought it could happen in Canada? I say fight like hell. Fight like hell. Along the shores of Lake Huron, in small towns and farming communities, roots run deep and working the land is a labor of love. But for many people here, a fog of misery has set in. I cry every day. I cry every day. My heart is broken beyond belief. Norma Schmidt's home used to be her castle. Well, it was the labor of love. This, this was a home, a dream home. 13 acres that my husband had bought before we married in 1978. I moved here in 1979. We've Move the staircase from one side of the house totally over to the other side of the house. Over the years, the Schmitz lovingly restored the 150-year-old farmhouse and raised a family here in the community of Underwood, northwest of Toronto. Total new cupboards. Each room was our dream, was our vision for what we wanted it to be. The outside was what we wanted it to be, what we dreamt our grandchildren would love it to be. After a long career in nursing, Norma was looking down the road to retirement and reaping the rewards of a life of hard work and giving. But everything changed after the wind developers came calling. We were told that this was good for the environment, it was free, it was good for our community, and we believed the bill of goods that we were sold. It is the largest scam we have ever heard in our lives. In the nearby community of Ripley, school teacher Sandy McLeod was also open to the idea of wind turbines, at least at first. I phoned my council member, uh, I phoned Jim Hanna, and I said to him, I asked him I straight up, I said, Jim, what, what's going on here? And he said, Sandy, the provincial government wants these things and it doesn't matter what we do, we just, uh, they're going to come no matter what we do. And they arrived en masse to communities all along the Lake Huron shore and elsewhere in the province. The arrival of wind turbines changed the face of Ontario's countryside forever. It was under the Ontario Liberal government's green-obsessed watch that the first wind mega-projects were approved in short order and construction got started. But in the Liberals' mad dash to ramp up wind power, were affected communities properly consulted and given a say? Were they aware and did they care about the potential health effects for people who lived close to the turbines? People like Sandy McLeod? I always thought that the professionals who we're going to allow this project and set, set up the safety recommendations for this project would have done
their professional due diligence. We asked about what would happen to our health. As the turbines went up, those concerns grew and the beginnings of a rural backlash began. Sandy's home ended up almost surrounded by the turbines. And soon, she and members of her family started feeling sick. We had significant blood pressure changes, ringing in the ear, constant. And, and it, the, the ringing was intense, like it felt like as if, as if somebody was taking a Q-tip and just shoving it in your ear. Your heart would pound and neighbours would complain of headaches that they'd never had before. The symptoms were so, so extreme and so severe. She says the noise, this noise, was unrelenting. So just what would it be like to live in the shadow of these mammoth turbines? To get an idea of just how big industrial wind turbines are, you've really got to get up close. From 300 up to 500 feet tall, that's 50 stories that this wind turbine reaches up to. And when it comes to the blades, well, they're as wide as a 747. Oh, it's, it's difficult. I haven't opened these in, in years. Right from day one, Sandy kept a meticulous diary of what was happening to her family's health. We had been five months sleep deprived. Turbines cycling very high, high pitch ringing, right ear, ringing hard, chest pounding. I'm feeling very sad, very tired, trying to get some sleep, ears ringing. Turbines sound like jets. So that's in May of 2008. We were like mama bears and papa bears. We wanted to protect our families. Some people had lived in that area their entire life. The road we lived on, one of the ladies had lived there her whole life and she had never experienced this ever. We tried so hard to stop what happened to us. Sandy's friend and neighbor, Kim Calling, watched helplessly while others whispered. There were five families who were very severely affected by the turbines. There were a few people around the area that said it was all in their heads. It was almost like it was the, those families were alone in a little pack and no one else was helping them. Every day we were like, we were like lab animals being tested on. The Ripley Wind Farm Project split the community between landowners who signed contracts to take the turbines and neighbours who lived in their shadows. It divided the community. It divided it completely. Yeah. Very sad, especially in a farming community. They're usually close-knit. Everybody helps everyone else. I have letters that I have written directly to the Premier. In her desperation, Sandy tried to contact the Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty. I said that we had been suffering very serious health problems since the turbines began generating. The mysterious health problems only got worse. We begged for sleep. February 22nd of 2009, I had heart attack symptoms. I had to go to the hospital. It was the same for Norma Schmidt in her community about 20 minutes north. 12 wind turbines within close range of her home, including one only 450 meters away. A flicker on her front door, a constant reminder. She got progressively sicker and weaker. Nausea, vomiting. The nausea became so severe, um, I eventually went down to 98 pounds. Over time, I just couldn't manage. Her suffering, she says, pushed her to the very edge. Severe depression, and ultimately, I became suicidal. Things got so bad, she was forced to leave her beloved profession. I love nursing. A nurse is what I am. It's the gift God gave me. I had the dream career of teaching nursing students. Dream, dream career. Nursing students are just 
the best thing on earth. Her health, her life in peril, Norma's doctor advised her to leave her home, the home she loved. Norma's world crumbled. So I begged them to buy me out. And I really thought I could walk away. But I kept coming back. And I kept coming back. And it was like ripping my heart out, my heart and my soul. It, it's not a house, it's not four walls. It's the place we buried our pets. It's the place my tulips are out there, my four, my five-year-old. Planted when there were tiny dots. It's memories that I wanted to carry to my grandchildren. It's my heart and my soul that I've left behind here. And now I'm in a room in my daughter's house. That's not my home. That's not my heart and soul. I'm in a town where I don't want to be. This is where I want to be, where I choose to be, where I choose to live, where my life is. How dare they? Make me leave my home, my life, what I choose to have. How dare they? They've no right, but yet the government gives them to right, the right. They give them a card blanche. It's not acceptable in Ontario. We lost our property. That sickening sense of loss was also like a punch to the gut for Sandy McLeod, as she too was forced to leave her beloved home. And it's not just here, in communities around Lake Huron, where we found stories of people getting sick and of residents battling big wind projects. We found similar stories all across the province, to the southeast, along the shores of Lake Erie, in a tiny town of Clear Creek. We found an 84-year-old woman who planned to spend the rest of her life in her dream retirement home, only to be forced out when the wind turbines went up. This is what Stefana Johnson sees from her kitchen window. Oh, okay. This is the home she had built, where she had planned to live the rest of her life. Then a wind power project came to her community. All 18 of them within three kilometers. That is a, a huge impact on on a community. Sometimes it sounded to me as I was trying to sleep and I could hear a rumbling sound. Uh, uh, well, I thought it was a train, but it wasn't. It was just the turbulence from the wind turbines. And other times it sounded like a 747 just hovering overhead for hours on end. And just like those in other wind projects, Safana too began experiencing health problems and I would lie in bed and I would feel the vibrations in my intestines and think, what on earth is happening? There are times when I actually feel sick to my stomach and I feel like bringing up. I feel real nausea, just horrific. And there are times when I feel very dizzy. And this is one time I fell. I, I lost all control of my body. I just, just lost. And like Norma, Stefana now only visits her old home. We've spent a hundred years almost developing this property. Back up near Lake Huron, farmer Sean Drennan looks out at land that's been in his family for generations. Land that may soon be surrounded by a forest of towering turbines. One on this side, two over here, between here and the lake, I'm thinking there'll be 10 to 12. Of the 140, we'll probably be able to see most of them. There's almost nowhere in our township that's actually cost safe. The Drennan's dining room looks more like a war room as he fights his own battle against the next wave of mega wind projects slated for this area, including a giant one on his doorstep. Farms everything, Toss. If they are allowed to build, we'll leave. Like it's 140, 50 story buildings, 
You don't even have that in Toronto. The degradation that's going to go on here. We're talking 1,800 turbines up and down the shoreline. We're probably some of the most productive land in all of Ontario. Like, my God, uh, what are you people thinking? He's seen what happened with the earlier wind turbine projects. The Ripley project was built, and then we started hearing about people that were gagged, totally gagged on health. And we started to get a little worried. He's seen the destruction to the social fabric of a community. It has totally taken families apart. And now sees it in his own community. Really what's happened is community destruction. After years of fighting, legal challenges, review tribunals, community meetings, Sean saves his harshest words for the Liberal government and its obsessed wind power push. Ask us if they th we think it's a good idea. Don't tell us from your condo that it's a wonderful idea and this, you know, okay, the green thing is so great that, you know, we're going to force it on you. Drennan says the wind energy rush just doesn't make sense. Seeing as we don't need the power, um, we're not sure why the, why the Ontario Liberal government is rushing towards wind power. It's really hard to be here. It's so hard to be here. Sandy McLeod stops by her old home and instantly she is taken back to her darkest days. There it goes. Yep. You hear the roar, it goes whoosh, whoosh. That's awful. It should never happen. It should never happen. Wind power isn't a new idea, but in recent years it has been embraced by governments around the world as clean, green, and the way of the future. Canada joined in on the global green dream, and why not? Within 15 years in Canada, wind projects have emerged across several provinces, with provincial governments teaming up with wind turbine companies to get skyscraper high projects cemented into the ground. But it was in Canada's most populous province, Ontario, where newly elected Liberal politicians not only wanted to be Canada's leader in wind energy, but North America's. Our new Green Energy Act. We're talking about jobs, Speaker. We're talking about economic growth at the same time we're talking about clean and green electricity. The price of energy from wind and the sun will come down. And they understand that investing in those kinds of technologies creates new jobs in the province of Ontario. They want new jobs, they want clean and clean elect green uh, electricity, and they want us to do more in the fight against climate change. To realize their green dream, the Ontario Liberal government stripped local authorities of customary planning and zoning tools and introduced the Green Energy and Green Economy Act. It was draconian, is actually what it was. It took away every part of our planning and municipal ability to, to actually have any say in the, <coughs> in the project. Jane Wilson is the president of Wind Concerns Ontario, a province-wide advocacy organization. Draconian is probably not too far a stretch. The then premier was very uh, paternalistic and patronizing with people and uh, about the whole thing. Wind Concerns Ontario is just one of the organizations that has been created to expose the failures of the Liberals' green power plan. By introducing the Green Energy Act, the Liberals were intent to quickly transform a fifth of the province's electricity sector into a wind and solar power giant. It was done in the name of environmentalism. The Liberals wanted to be the first jurisdiction in North America to eliminate coal-fired plants. They also envisioned creating brand new green jobs. If you object to this, it's because you're nimbies and you're stupid and, you know, not giving any credence to the fact that people want to protect their homes and their communities. To many, the move has turned out to be one of the most controversial economic and environmental policy decisions in the province's history. Thousands of rural residents are now waging a war against wind turbine projects. When you have a piece of legislation that supersedes 21 acts in Ontario, and that includes the Clean Water Act, uh, there's a couple of acts that protect certain areas like the Niagara Escarpment, Oak Ridges Moraine, um, the Heritage Act, 
In order to get that Green Energy Act passed, they had to override 21 pieces of legislation. People are telling me they've never seen anything like that. Tom Adams is a longtime Ontario energy analyst. McGinty, in the time when he was considering the, the Green Energy Act, really was not focused on, on you know, Grey Bruce County. You know, he was not, didn't really care about the electoral votes that he was going to swing uh, in Haldeman or something like that. Um, he, he, you know, he had this vision and, and, uh, and, he, and he could get urban voters on side. They took away our uh, local municipalities' right to have any say in, the, in the, the projects at all. If you had a community who didn't want them, they can still walk in and, and do it. The way that the Green Energy Act has been written, where there is no real recourse with it, and how they've you know, stripped your municipal rights and stripped your own property rights and allowed wind companies to be able to force their rights onto your properties. But in less than eight years, Ontario's landscape has seen thousands of wind turbines introduced, and that number is growing. Today, electricity prices in Ontario are the highest Ontarians have ever seen, in fact, the highest in North America. Our electricity bills have doubled or tripled. Um, it hasn't helped this community at all. <laughs> it's Friday night at a town hall meeting in Armau, Ontario. The community near Lake Huron is slated for a new wind turbine project. The folks here are at a fundraiser to raise money for the legal fight to keep turbines out of their community. This is our fight, this is our community. Everybody in this room is part of this fight. It's gonna affect everybody. Turbines are built, you're on your own. Unless we stop this, there's going to be more guinea pigs. And that's all the government of Ontario sees us as. We are guinea pigs. If you don't like it, move, if you can sell your house. In the crowd lending support were Sandy McLeod and a few others from the earlier Ripley project, where people had suffered health effects. I think that community is rallying together a lot better than this one did. They seem very well equipped, much better equipped than we were at dealing with it because of the experience of the people here. And they know what they need to be afraid of. It's rare now for communities to meet for potluck dinners just to catch up. Now these dinners are equipped with petitions, pamphlets, signs and microphones. Thousands of people in Ontario now regularly attend town hall meetings and protests. They share stories on websites and blogs, and they raise funds to take legal action and commission health and noise studies. It is really grassroots people power out in rural Ontario. Esther Reitman is one of the community organizers, bloggers, and concerned citizens in Ontario. I realized there wasn't a wind action group started here at all. There was nothing to inform people, so I started. I just put a blog up to start with and started putting pamphlets out, holding meetings, public meetings around our place. So that's uh, how it started, and um, it just kind of grew from there into protests as more meetings from the wind companies came forward. She has spent a lot of time fighting. I put several hours at least into this blog every day uh, for, for several years now. And um, yeah, it's just to keep people informed of what's happening elsewhere because a lot of times it's the same stuff happening throughout Ontario and people need to share that, um, those ideas and such too. It's not like it's all um, in one area. Say if you had it in the city, one issue happening there and a whole bunch of people living there. Here it's just a few people living out and all these little pockets throughout Ontario, so you have to have some network to keep them together. Esther sees Ontario's plight as being the worst in Canada. I think maybe something a little bit different in Ontario is the proximity of these turbines to homes, to so many homes, because the Green Energy Act just allows for areas to be obliterated by turbines. They're not um, out in some field away from everybody. They're on the backs of our homes and around our schools. So. It's uh, much more in our face in Ontario. There's a conversation out there that there's no problems in Alberta, but the fact is the farm size in Alberta is 10 times bigger than that. The average farm is 1,000 acres. The average farm here is 100 acres. 
so they're 10 times bigger. So the distance from that receptor home is 10 times further. So we're not going to see the same issues when they're further away from people's houses. Those living here believe the Green Energy Act was not built for the protection of the citizens or the environment, but for the protection of the companies. Many felt sidelined, ignored, or bullied by wind turbine companies and completely ignored by every arm of the Ontario government when they'd ask for help. There's not consultation. What happened was people were objecting. And we went to uh, Queen's Park and we made presentations to uh, the various ministers there asking for, for to be consulted and to take a precautionary approach to the building of these turbines. Whether you contacted the companies, whether you contacted the Ministry of the Environment, whether you contacted the, the um, Environmental Commissioner, which we did, whether you contacted the um, Ombudsman, whether you contacted the Premier, it didn't matter who you reached out to, you were not getting well, you were getting sicker. No matter what the groups do to fight, the wind turbine companies still have more money and they are also side by side with the Liberal government. They do whatever they want. When you don't know, you don't do. And what we see with the government of Ontario is they just simply don't know, they don't care, they keep moving on with projects. Many, many important people, people who've really thought about this and uh, knew what the impacts might be, went and presented their view <coughs> to those uh, hearings. Um, after that, the act got passed. Uh, Premier, then Premier McGuinty said, this is the kind of, we're fighting nimbyism and we're just not going to have, quote, a patchwork of regulations. So, uh, in essence, he was speaking to the people of Ontario, but also to the municipalities of Ontario when he took away their, their planning powers for what was going on in their communities. Oh, it feels like we're in a, a communist country. How many times must our rights be attacked to satisfy somebody's greed? There has been so much outrage created by the government over wind power, and yet it only represents a small slice of Ontario's electricity grid. Our government thinks that 3% of um, wind energy production right now is, is, um, is viable. We'll see what 3% looks like in a pie chart, literally a pie. The Liberals' energy plan showed wind power production at only 3% in 2013. The troubling news is that Liberals want to nearly quadruple the number. Increasing it to 11% is the most enormous mistake, health-wise, environment-wise, economy-wise, and if the people of Ontario let this happen, the future gener generations in Ontario are going to suffer. So why was rural Ontario's concerns repeatedly ignored? Why were local authorities stripped of their powers? Why did the Liberals move so aggressively with their Green Dream plan? Ontario's main opposition party, the Progressive Conservatives, have long questioned the economic merits of the Ontario Liberal government's green energy plan. Why in the world do you want to continue with Dalton McGuinty's failed green energy subsidies, putting wind turbines across the province, Question. like giant pins on a pin cushion? It's economic madness. It's costing us jobs. We turn to Professor Ross McKittrick, an economist. He recently published a very scathing review of how economically unsound the Ontario Liberal government's Green Energy Act is. Well, the important thing to understand about wind turbines is they don't run on wind, they run on subsidies. We went to see McKittrick at the University of Guelph. All the arguments that they put forward for the Green Energy Act, uh, they really turned out to be phony once we looked at them closely. They said that it would improve the economy, it would reduce air pollution emissions, and it would um, uh, replace coal-fired power. And the problem is with, um, with the first one, 
It's not going to improve the economy because what you're doing is replacing power that costs three to five cents per kilowatt hour to generate and you're replacing it with power that costs at least 13 and a half cents per kilowatt hour to generate. So you're raising the cost of doing business. It will drive down the rate of return in manufacturing and mining and that has to translate into job losses and, and reduced investment and, and uh, shrinking the economy. So you've pointed out that wind energy, in fact, isn't in the public interest in the short term, but will it be in the long term? Nobody was building wind turbines in Ontario until the government started throwing money at it. It is not a profitable it is a source of electricity. It's not cost effective. Wind turbines can't compete on the wholesale market without a lot of government support. The system used to fund wind energy in many places around the world is called a feed-in tariff. And that means if you build uh, a, a bank of wind turbines somewhere and you get the contract that everybody's looking for, you get a guarantee of 20 years being paid 13 and a half cents per kilowatt hour for the electricity that's generated. While the wholesale rate in Ontario is typically between two and four cents per kilowatt hour. The Ontario government piggybacked off what is a European idea of a feed-in tariff policy where the prices are locked in for 20-year contracts. And here's another head-scratcher. The other provision of the contracts is that the system has to buy the power from you whenever you produce it. So the standard power plants, nuclear plants and hydro plants and so forth, there's no guarantee for them the system will buy their power. They have to compete on the wholesale market. They have to price their product, in this case electricity, so that the system operator will buy it. With wind turbines, if the blades are running, the system operator has to buy it. Now they have adjusted that slightly in the last year because of this problem of the system operator basically being forced to buy tons and tons of power when it doesn't need it, buy it at 13 and a half cents per kilowatt hour, sell it on the export market at one or two cents per kilowatt hour. It was costing hundreds of millions of dollars a year for the system operator to do that. So the province now allows the system operator to reject some of the power that the wind turbines produce and instead the province will pay the wind turbine owners a, a benefit for what they call deemed production. So it's really just transferred that same cost onto the taxpayers now. The bottom line is pretty good for the wind energy sector. They get a 20-year contract to sell wind power at far above market rates and it doesn't matter that they're generating power at times when the province absolutely doesn't need it and we can't use it and we just have to try to find some neighboring jurisdiction to buy it from us. And across the lake there is Michigan, one of Ontario's neighbors, and where Ontario sends much of its excess power at a very discounted rate to the people of Ontario. It's a dilemma, I guess, that no one in rural Ontario has really figured out why the push and why the rush. It doesn't make sense to any of us. Uh, if we were in a, uh, an electrical shortage, um, possibly, we're not. When the wind turbines blow, we dump steam at the nuclear plants, lessening their years that they'll run, and they dump water over Niagara Falls. That's the greenest you can get. You can't get anything greener than Niagara Falls. We don't really understand that. It was estimated that last year, Ontario lost over a billion dollars for selling excess power to neighboring jurisdictions. So how much is this going to cost Ontarians altogether? It's costing all together for the province between four and five billion dollars to cope with the cost of the Green Energy Act so far. And we've only got about a tenth of the power that we need to meet their goals. If they actually fulfill this commitment, it will end up being about 70 times the cost of the retrofit and the other um, processes they could have followed coming out of that 2005 cost-benefit analysis to get the equivalent environmental benefits. Some report the Green Energy Act as costing even more, up to eight billion dollars. And yet, despite all the red flags, McKittrick says his study was completely ignored by the Ontario Liberal government. In 2011, Ontario's Auditor General took a swipe at the Liberals for never having completed a cost-benefit assessment before implementing the Green Energy Act. The Auditor General in 2011 said you really need to do a cost-benefit analysis before you proceed. They didn't ever do that. Not to this day has the government done that. In fact, the Auditor General Jim McCarter said, we expected but did not find that a comprehensive and detailed economic analysis or business case had been prepared. 
and signing billions of dollars of contracts, McCarter said their high cost will add significantly to ratepayers' electricity bills in the future. And that they did. The big concern across the province is what it's doing to people's electricity bills. We're starting to see a new problem, which is energy poverty, where um, people are getting these electricity bills that are just not affordable. So what's that going to do? And I think you saw recently there was a, a protest about the bills and people are holding up signs saying, eat or eat. Hey, 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 lying liberals have to go! We used to have a few large power plants in Ontario, and, and we had a grid that was optimized to source the electricity from a few large central locations. We're now shutting down the large central locations and replacing them with this proliferation of tiny little unreliable wind farms and you have to build a whole new grid to accommodate that. So that's again an extra cost to get something we already had. What's more is that the Green Energy Act hasn't even come close to creating the number of jobs the Liberals claimed it would. It turned out that the province had claimed that there were going to be 50,000 new jobs created from the Green Energy Act. When the Auditor General asked them to back that up, because it doesn't really make sense that this would create any jobs, what they admitted was they were really talking about temporary construction jobs. As you put up wind turbines, you need some workers in to do that. But then once the wind turbines are built, then those jobs disappear and there are no ongoing jobs. In economics, it's, it's an old fallacy called the broken window fallacy. If you go around breaking shopkeepers' windows since they have to hire uh, repair people to fix the windows, then you've somehow improved the economy. But you haven't. All you've done is increase the cost of having what you had before, which was windows in stores. It's daft. We are paying to give away excess electricity. How stupid is that? We have companies leaving because they can't afford to pay the ridiculous high electricity rates we are charging. We can't afford to lose industry in Ontario. We are now a have-not province. There he is! In the 2012 leadership race to replace Dalton McGuinty, Liberal candidates admitted the Green Energy Act was flawed. In fact, now Premier Kathleen Wynne said we didn't get it perfect the first time around but I am committed to working with our partners and communities across the province to get it right. Projects, however, are still getting approved by the government despite community objections. Hey, hey, Liberals, you're fired, you're fired! Norma Schmidt confronted Premier Wynne at an anti-wind turbine protest. My life has been made a living hell. So I've had to leave my home. We need your help. Why aren't you listening? We also confronted the Premier. The government approved a 92 wind turbine project for the community of Grand Bend and overrode the community's wishes to do so. And it's really fired up and angered uh, the community, including uh, the local mayor who declared the community an unwilling host to wind turbines. What would you say uh, to the community who feels as though this is a devastating blow to have the project approved? Well, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, I would say uh, that, um, you know, we are, we're committed to clean renewable energy. We are shut down the coal plants. We're committed to clean air. We're committed to clean renewable energy. We also are committed to a better process around siting, um, siting uh, energy infrastructure. And so um, we've put new rules in place. The fact is that there are contracts that are in place. Um, we are, we are not going to hold us bolus, cancel those contracts because that would not be responsible. How However, many Ontarians think that cancelling contracts is the responsible thing to do. And I'm afraid that Kathleen Wynne is just going along with everything Samsung deals and um, everything that has raised our electricity bills. She can't seem to be able to stop it. And um, I'm hoping that some government will in the near future, but if we keep the Liberal government, we, will, we won't be able to stop. Anything. In fact, more than 80 mayors have now declared their communities unwilling hosts to new turbine projects. 
We have the municipalities officially passing resolutions and, and doing other things, and also people in the community saying, you know, this isn't right. We should have a right to say what's going on. Residents have also voiced major concern over plummeting property values due to the close proximity to wind turbines. Your property value loss could be 10 to 48 percent, if not 100 percent, as some of the homes are not selling at all. So you ripple that through Ontario and just look at, well, it's 100,000 here and, you know, how many homes does that mean? That's millions upon millions of dollars of lost property value, lost equity for those families. If the new shift to green power is so inefficient, why hasn't anyone working in the system spoken out? There are a couple of reasons. Uh, the Power Workers Union has uh, spent money on advertisements. They did try to fight against the closing of Lambton and Nanticoke. They understood that this was a bad deal for the workers in the province, and uh, they did what they could. But it's hard to be up against a government that's, that's pushing so much propaganda on coal. There were people, certainly in, in the power generating sector, who understood that the government's numbers weren't correct and didn't add up but uh, they were effectively muzzled. McKittrick speaks to people all the time about the changes in the system. I do find people working in the power sector, they know that this is a crazy system. These wind farms are displacing hydroelectricity, which is just a waste on every level because we have the hydroelectric facilities. They don't generate any air pollution emissions. They give us reliable, predictable baseload power and now we run wind, wind turbines and let those hydro facilities sit idle. And um, so people who work in the sector, they can see what's going on and, and they know that this is a, a waste. But uh, for understandable reasons, they're not about to um, make a big noise about it because they could lose their jobs if they do. It's flawed and it's costing us, but so many people are now used to turning a blind eye and wearing rose-colored glasses. It was considered professionally embarrassing. It just seemed like such an outrageous thing that you would build all these expensive power plants and not utilize the, 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 their capability to supply energy. Um, now, we do this all the time. You know, and our, our electricity system is, to the people that run it, has become a joke. Uh, and but they 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 daren't raise a finger to oppose. So what is the connection between these and these? Blood pressure high, headache, heart pounding, nausea, vomiting, severe migraines, sick to my stomach, heart palpations, uh, inability to sleep. These cluster of symptoms affecting some people who live close to towers is widely known as wind turbine syndrome. And the list of symptoms includes many that the people we spoke to said they had suffered from. About a third of people exposed will report adverse health effects. Dr. Robert McMurtry is considered a leading expert in Canada on the health effects of wind turbines. The former Senior Health Canada official and University Dean of Medicine says of all the symptoms, sleep disturbance can be the most debilitating. When chronic sleep disturbance and disruption uh, is a, a risk, it's a risk for serious adverse health effects, including heart disease in particular, but also such things in the long term as cancer. So I'm saying it's a risk. It's, I don't want to be creating fear in the sense of it's any guarantee but uh, it's, it's known to be. And in, in saying that, I'm quoting the National Institutes of Health and Environmental Health Perspectives. For many victims who say the wind turbines are making them sick, it's not just the maddening sound that keeps them on edge and keeps them up at night, it's also what you can't hear, and experts agree. There are other types of noise emitted by turbines, such as low frequency infrasound. Another doctor, Carmen Crow, has done years of research on wind turbine syndrome. She says while the audible noise emitted by wind turbines is a factor, it's the inaudible or low frequency sound that humans can't hear, the infrasound, that takes the biggest toll on people's health, along with the pressure vibrations given off by the massive spinning blades. They're like huge fans and research going back many decades 
showed that that impulsive noise is very disturbing to people. We've got blades crossing in front of a tower and there's a pulse, uh, like an infrasound pulse and a swooshing sound which is uh, traumatic to listen to all the time. It just goes intervals, oof, oof, that type of noise. And then we've got an audible noise that also can be disturbing, especially at night when it's very, very quiet. For decades, there's been research on low-frequency noise and infrasound in animal species. Those emissions uh, have shown some tissue changes in the brain, the lungs, the heart, and the bowel. You can't hear the infrasound, but your body can feel it. I've had a lot of low-frequency testing here that proves the, the cyclical nature of um, the low frequency, um, the wind turbines here and the low frequency in my home. Experts say these forces, the air pressure changes, noise, vibration, even the flickering blades distort sensory signals in the body and, in effect, throw things off. This, over an extended period of exposure, can trigger physical and psychological symptoms. They're going around and around, and, and as it comes around, it pushes a pulse of air pressure out at you. It's kind of the same way with, with the, the infrasound, on for infrasonic sound and the pressure that's created by the wind turbine. Not everybody will be affected by it, but there will be a significant number of people that will be. Norma Schmidt recalls the paralyzing effect. You're not able to do anything. You're not able to cook. You're not able to clean. You're not able to live. You're not able to work. You're not able to live your normal life. You're not able to sleep. That's torture. Movement of the blades can give shadow flicker. Another health concern is shadow flicker, the spinning shadows given off by the massive blades affecting people in homes and on highways. Sometimes you can see that uh, in driving through leaves or something. It's very disturbing. And it does get in the house. And children, such as uh, autistic, they're very vulnerable because they'll watch the moving blade and almost enter into a mesmerizing state. And there's a, a school in, around Listowel that has a, a significant number of autistic children. And they're just going to build the turbines around the school, which I mean, just horrifies the people that are sending their children there. With these people falling sick in recent years, what about research into wind turbine syndrome here in Canada? Surely, regulations in Ontario for wind turbines were based on comprehensive studies. Definitive research to establish what's a safe setback for people's homes from the turbines, right? You'd think. There's not a lot of field research to draw upon in providing advice to Canadians about potential health effects. Our journey for answers takes us inside an audio testing chamber in Ottawa, where Health Canada is almost two years into a two million dollar major study on the adverse health effects of wind turbines. We're starting to look at all the results, so that that's a massive undertaking with many people involved. The physical measures and the questionnaire that's all been collected uh, the infrasound measurements that we did at one location for an entire year, that's completed and the, the results of that are being analyzed. Dr. David Michaud says the study is far-ranging. To look at the concerns that we've been hearing from Canadians, that there are health effects associated with exposure to wind turbine sound. How exactly are you measuring the sound at each home where wind turbines are located? We did measurements in approximately 14 different homes. So we have sound power measurements around uh, all the different models of turbines in our study. And then we have the sound measurements, like I said, at the 14 representative homes in our study. The reason they initiated the Health Canada study was they had thousands of complaints from across rural Ontario, people living in close proximity to industrial turbines. They found a similar pattern, headaches, nausea, dizziness, sleep deprivation, high blood pressure. Everything we've heard about, they are finding. But experts on adverse health effects of wind turbines we spoke to say the Health Canada study may not go far enough. I've heard them say that they won't be able to establish causation nor have conclusive results. And honestly, uh, having a position in the past in Health Canada, it left me astonished that that's the product after two years and $2 million of research. 
having a study come out saying that we need more research is really going to uh, draw this out longer because more turbines are being placed in Ontario and uh, more approvals are coming through and we're seeing more people are going to be exposed. Which brings us to wind turbine regulations in Ontario. Eventually the province established the minimum distance that a turbine can be built from someone's home at 550 meters. For earlier projects it was even closer. So how did the Ontario Liberal government come up with that setback figure of 550 metres? And they're convinced that 550 metres is an adequate setback based on there's no supportive research. The fact is the government has no health study to back up their claims that 550 as a setback works. Instead of saying the health and safety of the community should come first, what should the setback be? They've said, what's the setback, and we'll ignore everything else. All the evidence points to a zone of health-affected homes situated too close to wind turbines. The closer the home, it seems, the worse the health problems are. It's generally within that first kilometer of the turbine where um, people are really affected. Ontario claims that its setbacks are safe. The setbacks aren't working, we have a problem. Until Health Canada comes up with that proper setback and really understands what's going on, that we should stop doing what we're doing. We have far too many health affected people. They're all saying the same thing, and this is something we're seeing worldwide. Our government here seems to want to ignore that. But worldwide, we're starting to see that pushback from, from average people that simply are saying, we're not necessarily anti-wind, anti-green, but what you're doing is not working for the health and safety of the people in the community. And so why, we ask, is industry and government not taking into consideration the growing body of evidence about health effects with new wind projects being announced and in the pipeline? There's been very good evidence of adverse health effects for over 30 years. That's number one. And number two, it's acknowledged by the industry. We, we have documents dating back 10 years on that. They know about it, but they know what to do to defend it. And they do it very, very well that when, when these tribunals come, their principal task is to create doubt about any claims of adverse health effects, even though anybody who's looked at the uh, people exposed finds adverse health effects, and they certainly can be serious, as we noted. Uh, but they argue that the proof is somehow not conclusive. And if the Health Canada study does raise red flags, does Dr. McMurtry think the Ontario government would put a moratorium on wind turbine projects? I don't think the current Liberal government are in, so inclined. There's a well-known pattern that once you get into something and you've committed, uh, that the, the likelihood of turning back diminishes as time passes, and they've got too much invested to admit the, the error. Any brain scan that I had, any uh, MRI, my brain was cl completely clear. But in 2009, there were some lesions on the brain. In January of 2014, um, an increase in number, an increase in size of lesions. Stefana Johnson knows that age 84 and in failing health, she won't be around for many more years but she wants to prove the harmful effects of wind turbines even after she dies. She has offered to donate her brain for research. These lesions are the result of something that's been happening to me since the turbines started generating. At least uh, there might be some value in uh, an autopsy and uh, an examination of my brain. So that's what lies ahead. But I'm prepared for that. We all die. <laughs> Wind power, what could be friendlier to the environment? But if we look behind the labels of clean energy, we found some dirty secrets. Remember, wind was sold by the Liberal government as the cleanest, greenest, smartest way for Ontario out with dirty coal, in with wind and solar. There were far smarter ways of creating energy 
I think uh, Ross McKittrick from the University of Guelph sat down and said, hey, if we had done nothing except put you know, the most advanced scrubbers on our coal plants, where would we be? And we would actually have as clean uh, an air as we do today. The Liberals have made the case that clean energy is far superior to what they say was dirty coal. It's been a political messaging tool that has helped to keep left of center voters in the Liberal camp. Premier Kathleen Wynne celebrated the end of coal in Ontario with former U.S. Vice President and climate change alarmist Al Gore. I'm proud today to announce that we will be introducing new legislation that if passed will make it illegal to burn coal. How did you find the moral courage to change, to rise up, to act? And part of the answer will be Ontario, Canada led the way. But is it true? According to the experts we spoke to, the green dream isn't so green after all. When they talk about displacing coal-fired power plants in Ontario with wind, that's not actually what happens. As they add wind capacity to the system, they're displacing nuclear and hydro, and those are non-emitting sources. And what they replace them with, it's not just wind turbines. You have to remember that whenever you see a wind turbine, there's a gas-fired power plant running in the background to balance out the load fluctuations. So it's always a wind and gas combination. So what they're doing is they're replacing emissions-free hydro and nuclear with a combination of wind and gas, and we'll actually end up with slightly higher emissions of air pollution than greenhouse gases as a result. In other words, wind is always backed up by a fossil fuel. Because turbines are, an, on average, efficient about 28% of the time in Ontario, and they also produce their energy out of sync with need, the wind energy needs a, a, a lot of gas-fired backup. It has to have base load backup. And so that, that then means there's going to be some pollution from that source. So you're paying for a wind turbine to turn, and you're paying for a gas plant to idle. You're double paying most of the time. It just, it's, it's asinine. Interestingly, the phasing in of natural gas plants in Ontario has become scandalous for the Ontario Liberals. The Liberals canceled two gas plant projects in a panic before the last election, precisely because voters disapproved. The scandal cost taxpayers over a billion dollars. Our experts took a good look at the science behind the Ontario government's green marketing. Based on what they found, it seems closer to junk science than truth. People have a really funny idea about where air pollution emissions come from. Ontario's air pollution levels have declined over the past 40 years, not in the past few years as the Liberal government claims. This is a listing of all the communities in Canada where Environment Canada maintains an archive of historical air quality records. And they tell a really fascinating story. Starting in 1974 and coming up to the present, right across the board, you'll see air pollution levels have gone down quite a bit. So here we are in 2009 when the Green Energy Act was being introduced and the province was out there saying, we have this crisis of rising air pollution levels. But the fact is that they know perfectly well that air pollution has been trending downward right across the board. Secondly, the electricity sector makes up only a small fraction of air pollution, which means coal pollution was never the threat the Liberals made it out to be. Particulate matter emissions uh, is the one that most people are concerned about. That's the stuff that makes for smog and soot and things like that. There is one sector that's the major source of particulate matter emissions across the board. And that, surprisingly, is dust from unpaved roads. Power generation was a relatively small contributor to particulate emissions compared to industry, agriculture, and especially dust from roads. Going through the years, it's a very steady picture that way. All we'd have to do is pave over a small fraction of the roads, maybe 1% of the unpaved roads in the province. If they were paved over, you would have more than offset the particulate emissions coming from industry. Dr. McMurtry says the Liberals have made a false claim that ending coal was the only way to go. There's no question there's been an effort to demonize coal. This decision was made by policy priority as opposed to merit. In other words, having a competition to see what would be the best way to reduce air pollution per dollar expended. That competition never happened. 
this was a priority-based decision. Experts recall when tons of money was poured into cleaning up coal plants in Ontario. We had coal plants that had installed on them modern, new, very effective scrubbers for cleaning up the, um, the emissions that had historically gathered public attention and concern around coal. Do you foresee coal plants coming back online? I foresee a date, not just when coal power comes back online, but when we build new coal plants. It'll be back. We're going to build coal plants. And what about wind turbines themselves and their effect on local environments? A lot of it isn't pretty. You can talk all you want about wind turbines and global warming and, you know, we don't need the power. Why are we, the, the environmental destruction? I mean, it's not hard for us to drive past it every day. Farmer Sean Drennan says wind turbines are actually damaging the environment. For one, he says they damage the lifeblood of farmers, the soil. One of the first questions we asked the wind company was about earthworms, because that's, that's what makes soils grow. It makes it, it, makes it uh, fertile. Um, and there's three different earthworms that you actually have in a soil, and if you lose one of them, you have none of them. Drennan says farmers in nearby Ripley started noticing something strange after that 38 turbine wind project was built. The earthworms were vanishing. You know, farmers are observant. They watch, they watch what happens on their properties. They said the seagulls would come so far on one side of the turbine, and then they would start about the same distance on the other side. And at first, they believed it was because the, the seagulls didn't like the turbines. What the seagulls are there for is to eat the earthworms when you're plowing, you're turning the soil up and the earthworms come up and it's food for them. It didn't take them too long to figure out there was nothing there for them. That the earthworms in that particular area around the turbine had left. Left, he says, because they are sensitive to surges of electrical charges and vibrations. Wind turbines do both. They create electrical charge and they create vibration. Earthworms feel vibrations and they flee. All of the work that we have spent over all of the years, in, in a few years or less, uh, you know, two or three years, we could be set back to nothing. He says there's a cost to this. Lands are going to get harder uh, without the earthworms to help open up the soil and create a viable and, and efficient soil. Um, food production will go down. Many farmers in areas of wind turbines are also concerned about how water tables are affected. Source water protection is an issue. The, the bases are going 50 feet in the ground, they're going into aquifers. There's many components of cement that are toxic. So he's saying, well, if you put 100 of these things up and they're in the ground 50 feet, is there not an issue within the aquifers? And the effect on livestock? Kim Collings' husband ran a dairy operation in Ripley. After the turbines went in, he noticed the cattle began to act strange. They'd be jumping around, their tails would be switching. They just weren't comfortable. She thinks it was due to what's called dirty electricity. When excess power has nowhere to go, it leads to surges of high-frequency voltage flowing right into homes, farms, and buildings nearby. If a cow's getting a jolt or a electric shock every time it drinks. It's not going to drink very well and it's also not going to produce very much milk because it's not drinking. And especially if the turbines were on, if they were running, milk production would drop. Not to mention the impact on bird populations. These towers that were almost 500 feet high were going to be impacting the migra migrating birds. And we have two flyways um, which come through this area. Before the turbines were put up, we always had spring and fall migrating tundra swans that would be feeding on uh, either corn fields or um, soybean fields for about three weeks. And there were tens of thousands of them. And you know, after the turbines went up, I haven't seen a single one. It pushes aside any protection of the environment, birds, wildlife. I mean, the wind companies are great at saying, well, we, you know, we came in and we did all these studies. But well, we watched them do the studies. They sit on the side of the road, they drink coffee all day, and they tell you how many bobcats, how many birds, 
you know, how many fish. But they're never in the bush. They're never walking through <laughs> looking and, and seeing. One Ontario community fought against a wind turbine project to protect the habitat of an endangered species of turtle, only to lose the fight in court. The government fought the community in this case. Esther Reitman is a dedicated environmentalist who's got a big problem with wind turbines. That's all they need is a facade. They don't need to see details. And um, unfortunately, when you live out here, that's all you see is the details, and it does not look green at all. They're breaking all kinds of drains and such along prime agricultural land. This is not green. Putting in concrete, they'll never have to take out. 40 truckloads per turbine base. <laughs> it's ridiculous what's going in here. She thought environmental groups would help in the fight, but did they ignore her? Yeah, this is an issue that most of them don't want to touch. And yeah, a lot of the, the organizations, they want to be quiet about it. It's, it's too, too much of a risk for them to speak out on it, which is scary because that leaves us without experts to speak out. They have the knowledge, they know about it, but they won't speak because um, they're being helped financially by the province or even wind companies. Another climate change alarmist, David Suzuki, recently dismissed environmental concerns associated with wind turbines. We can't shout about the dangers of global warming, he said, and then turn around and shout even louder about the dangers of windmills. If one day I look out from my cabin porch and see a row of windmills spinning in the distance, I won't curse them, I will praise them. The main driver of green energy was, in part, a government with a pledge to voters they'd do their bit for climate change. But another main driver was a very well-organized industry, often foreign players with polished sales pitches, as well as those at home with close ties to the Liberals. The uh, president of the Ontario Liberal Party, uh, Mr. Crawley, was at the same time CEO of one of uh, Canada's largest wind power developers. At one point, I recall, there was a list of projects that were up for approval, and his company was in the top ten with uh, four or five projects. So it's, you know, if that happened with anything else, you would be certainly scratching your head and saying, there's something funny here. Mike Crawley is a big political operative for the Liberal Party, including having served as president. It's about much, much more. He's a former president of wind energy company AIM Powergen and now president for the Canadian division of another wind energy company, GDF Suez. In 2004, the Liberal government awarded Crawley with several lucrative wind power contracts. One was worth $475 million. Former opposition leader Bob Runciman said to the Liberals, your Liberal friends are now cashing in on a decision you made to the tune of a big red ribbon wrapped $475 million. How do you justify this extraordinary cost to a senior Liberal for a relatively small amount of power? The decision, of course, was to open the doors to subsidize wind power in Ontario. But that's not the whole story. I want to also tell you about a unique man who uh, perpetrated all of this stress uh, on our communities, and that was Mike Crawley. It was the way in which Crawley's company introduced wind turbines into communities that people are still bruised about today. My first introduction to um, Mike Crawley and uh, AIM Power Gen was in uh, December of 2004. Their company was um, doing a, a display of where the turbines were supposed to be going. Uh, and I guess uh, they were fulfilling their version of um, um, connecting with the community, just simply telling us what they were going to do. Did you meet with Mike Crowley personally? I talked to him for about an hour and I, I said to Mike, Mike, it's, it's, not, it's, it's unconscionable that you would build something that was destroying people's lives and not want to uh, help them get out of it. All I'm asking for is the money that I put into the house. I'm not asking for any you know, damages, nothing. Just what I put into the house so that I can move on and, and uh, try to live the rest of my life the way I'd hoped I might. 
And what did he say? He said he'd go back and, and speak to his colleagues in Toronto, and I never heard from him since. Here's somebody from just the background that I've looked at, is was with the Liberal parties, was with the finan financing campaign financing from what I understand, who turns around and gets some of the original projects. And then that person becomes the president of the federal level. So as, as just anybody who looks at that, you're, you're questioning, you're, you're questioning those connections. The Liberal Green energy giant Mike Crawley also served on the government's Electricity and Conservation and Supply Task Force, which reported into the Ontario Energy Minister. He chaired a government renewable working group and he co-chaired a renewable energy task team. And he has continued to have unfettered access to senior government officials, including several times between 2006 and 2013, such as attending a lunch organized by the president of the Ontario Power Authority, Colin Anderson, at Toronto's Hilton Hotel. When you're just creating rules and laws and uh, uh, to benefit your own party or your own friends, I mean, how, is, how does anything that like that ever get ever get past the light of day but uh, I guess that's the way politics works today it's just you know you grease my hand as long as I stay in business here as long as I stay in power long enough we can make all this happen and then you can just take the taxpayers money and run off to the Cayman Islands with it and and uh, and have a really jolly good old time we asked Mike Crawley for an interview and in an email response he said I am not available for an interview. I want to state very clearly that we are among several companies that have earned the opportunity to invest in renewable power projects in Ontario. All procurement processes have been open, fair and transparent. There is absolutely no basis, in fact, to suggest otherwise. Sincerely, Mike Crawley. Premier Dalton McGuinty also dismissed criticism, stating that the bidding process was open, fair and independent. The green energy movement in Ontario didn't happen overnight, but pretty close. I think in this period, like 2006, 2007, um, uh, some of the, the wind power industry started to come to Ontario. They were bidding in these auctions. You know, they were hiring lobbyists. They were hiring lawyers. They were starting to kind of get active at, at Queen's Park. The lobbyists, the consultants, they can smell opportunity. Ontario started to become a magnet for green energy uh, environmental groups. They got sitting down together. They had support from inside government. The government's own advisors sat on these committees and it was really a, you know, I can scratch your back, you scratch mine environment. The Liberals certainly didn't go it alone in how they wrote the Green Energy Act. They all sat down with environmental defense, David Suzuki Foundation, Ontario Clean Air Alliance, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, and they all worked up the language that they wanted in the legislation and built a campaign around it. Um, it's not enough. Like, this was very American style politics where you got the complete package. You got the PR side, you got the legislation drafting, you got the, uh, the, you know, the program to re-educate the public service, uh, to get the public servants all on, law, you know, on board, and you get a momentum going. You get the, you know, you get the Toronto Star uh, you know, uh, um, uh, editorial page cranking out a regular drumbeat, uh, you know, coal bad, wind good. Fast forward to today, and the number of people tied to the green energy industry has mushroomed. Many of the downtown law firms, the partners are themselves personally invested in a lot of the wind and solar and these other things. So yeah, the rate of return for these projects is so spectacular that the people in the energy business, actually not just the lawyers, but the retirement savings programs for the accountants that work in the electricity business, a lot of the executives that are in the conventional energy companies, a lot of pension funds are tied into this, insurance companies, gas utilities. I mean, it's, so much money has been spilled here that it's spread out over a big footprint. 
The number of public servants in Ontario earning more than $100,000 has tripled, including in Ontario's energy sector. In fact, there are now 12,300 people in the energy sector in this category. In 2013, Ontario Power Generation had nearly 8,000 employees on the Princess payroll. Hydro One had 3,700. The independent electricity system operator had 326. The Ontario Energy Board had 102. 12.8% of all government employees earning over 100 grand work in the energy sector. These are people that are paid well, um, they've got great pension plans. They wear the golden handcuffs. And they're not the ones that will save us from our own mistakes. The electricity industry professionals will see the, the wasted generation. They see that the wind uh, farms are generating just when the customers don't need the power. They see the, um, the grid reliability problems. And their response is, so long as we have a blank check to keep the lights on, it's all good. Employees in private sector generators are also collecting paychecks off ratepayer subsidies. Does it seem so wrong then that they return the favor by contributing to the Ontario Liberal Party war chest? Dufferin Wind Power contributed more than $14,000 to the Ontario Liberal Party in 2011 and 2012. Dufferin was recently awarded a 20-year contract to build 49 turbines in southern Ontario. Other wind energy companies to contribute to the Ontario Liberal Party include Invenergy, Nextera, the Niagara Region Wind Corporation, and Pattern Energy. And we can't forget the industry associations. The Canadian Wind Energy Association and Canadian Solar Industries Association jumped on board to contribute more than $24,000. It's really disheartening. You, you have no, no faith in the, in the companies or in the government. You know that they're just so intertwined. The Green Energy Act is very much a draconian act that was brought in by a government that wanted to bulldoze away the democratic rights the charter rights of people who are facing wind projects. Does the Green Energy Act violate the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Are outraged citizens turning to Canada's constitution to fight wind energy? These things are imposed on people and they are getting no choice. And so that begs the question of whether it's charter compliant, whether it complies with constitutional principles to put these people through these things without um, being assured of a certain level of safety. Several families have hired constitutional lawyer Julian Faulkner to take the challenge on. The citizens have the right to appeal that order. The process they've created is so uh, uh, imbalanced and so weighted in favor of the wind turbine companies, it's as if they wrote the legislation. It's embarrassing, frankly. Kevin McGee's family is just one of many who have lost an appeal at the province's environmental review tribunals. We're not surprised by the decision that the ERT uh, ruling that, that uh, the appeal was dismissed. Um, no appeal of an ERT has ever um, um, worked. Faulkner addressed this town hall where 600 angry people gathered. The biggest question I have is at what point in time are they going to give their heads a shake and say this is not what we do to members of the public. This is not how we honorably discharge our fiduciary, political, moral obligation to the public. Using our money. That's right. <laughs> they don't care. McGee and others are now taking their case to the next level, Ontario Divisional Court. Our appeal and our win in Divisional would be a precedent for all of Ontario. If Health Canada is spending millions studying something, doesn't that mean they don't know the answer? And if they don't know the answer, why are these things being built around your homes? There have been more than 20 appeals in Ontario to kill projects, but with no success. A citizen must prove that the turbines will harm them. That's interesting uh, that that's the standard they have to meet 
uh, to, uh, uh, to basically uh, successfully appeal these orders, that they have to prove that wind turbines will hurt them. In circumstances where the government is studying that very question, so the government doesn't know the answer. If the citizen can't prove with certainty that the wind turbines will hurt them, um, in other words, if it's only a risk, a serious risk, then the turbines get built. These communities are spending so much of their own money. We are constantly fundraising from grassroots levels. We are not getting our money from the, the oil companies or the uh, nuclear or anything else that's, that's implied by the, the wind companies. It, it's very much people you know, dipping into their RSPs and their savings to, to fight for their security, their security person, their, their safety and their, their property values. I would like to make a donation of $2,000 to assist with the legal challenges ahead. How much are people spending to fight this? Hundreds of thousands of dollars, no doubt. I, I, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, this um, is the only example by any means of people having to expend uh, large uh, legal uh, fees in order to fight uh, government and to fight large companies, but it's a classic example. And it's not a drop in the bucket for taxpayers either. That's very true, because the Ministry of the Environment hires, has its own lawyers. And uh, then there's the staff in the Ministry of the Environment, the, the tribunal staff, yes. Sometimes there's a panel of, of three, uh, but sometimes it's only one lawyer. But then they've got all their travel expenses and that type of thing too. What greets the citizen when they come to the hearing room door is the invariable Bay Street firm. Every single one of these wind turbine companies has Bay Street firms working for them. Very interesting. It really sends the message of how much money they are making off this thing. I don't have the education to fight this on a legal level at all. <laughs> Esther Reitman appealed a wind turbine project slated for her community. At the same time, she was hit with a slap suit by a wind turbine company. Esther protested the company's move to cut down an active eagle's nest from a tree to make way for wind turbines. We are rural uh, people out here, farmers and such, and, and we have to be experts on everything, and we can't. I mean, we're supposed to be working at our nursery. We're supposed to, last year when I had to fight the tribunal hearing, plus the next air lawsuit, I couldn't hardly work at all at the nursery. And that, that's pretty devastating. It's like a case of David versus Goliath, Esther says, with government and companies working side by side. I watched that and how you have the Ministry of Environment sitting right beside the wind company, talking during your tribunal hearings, sharing all their information as if it's them against you. That makes no sense. Government should be separate from that. Wind Concerns Ontario has been noticing and documenting questionable practices by the government and wind companies. Some people who qualified as an expert witness at one didn't at another, even though they were speaking, speaking on the same issues. Jane Wilson has requested the Ontario Ombudsman immediately investigate these inconsistencies. We're finding things with the approval process and, and uh, it's come to a head with some of them where the documentation provided by the wind power developer is being, quote, deemed complete by the Ministry of the Environment. But when the community groups do an audit on these documents, they're not complete. And in fact, some of them are, the documents are not even there. They're promised, perhaps, but uh, in some cases, some things are, they're not quite right. Uh, the consultants didn't actually go and visit sites. In one case, it's arguable whether they even studied the right species of bat. The fight has taken a toll on Esther and her family. And now, you are, your family is moving out of province. Yeah, we have to move the, um, from the farm where I was born, and uh, that really hurts. It's, it's definitely really painful. Um, you know every little nook and cranny of the place. It's, it's in you, because you were a little kid when you were walking around there. And so, it's not a decision that was made lightly at all. But we all knew, my parents and my husband knew that if these turbines go up, we aren't going to risk our health, which is the other thing they could take from us, and I'm not going to risk that. Come here, Clee. Come on, Cleo. If Sean Drennan is able to prove that there's a reasonable risk that he will be harmed by what the state has approved being built, then he should be entitled to stop it. No one should be submitted or subjected to a reasonable risk of harm. Right now, the ERT says 
it's only a reasonable risk of harm. You haven't proved that it will happen. Therefore, you lose. That's ridiculous. Sean and Trish Drennan say they would have regrets if they didn't continue on with their fight. We have, you know, children, grandchildren, you know, will they look at us 30 years from now and go, well, Grandpa, why didn't you fight? Hmm. And we're not going to have that, and we're, not, we're just not going to let that happen. I say fight like hell. Fight like hell. I'll tell you why. Because your life will never be the same. Your community will never be the same. Resistance to wind turbines has plunged Ontario into becoming like ground zero for a global anti-wind turbine movement. They were way before us and they were asking for help before us. You have the people in Quebec, you have the people in BC, you have the people in Ontario, you have the people, you have the people who are in Spain, you have the people who are in England, you have the people who are in Australia. Same companies, same complaints. Other governments around the world have backed off. The UK Prime Minister has said enough is enough and is pledging to back off new turbines. Spain made the same move in 2012. A surprising move was when the German government, the godfather of feed-in tariffs, signaled it was considering backing off this costly policy. A number of US states have been rethinking wind turbines as well, including Oklahoma, which has hit the pause button. Will any politicians in Ontario make the same pledge? You have to shut them down. That's the only way to get rid of these turbines. Shut them down. It's either stop this or our children's and our grandchildren's futures are uh, more servitude. Is this a risky proposition to renegotiate or terminate contracts? The Minister of Energy is saying he can't get out of these contracts. They're signed, that's done. We don't believe that's true. Jane Wilson says the Ontario government already has the ability to terminate projects in the system now. She points to the case of Trillium Power's proposal to develop offshore turbines in Lake Ontario. The Ontario Liberals reversed their initial approval of the project. The legal opinion that came out of that was the government has the right to change its mind. It's a government. It can do that. So I, I, there's a number of legal firms have commented on this and it's right in the Ministry of the Environment's own legislation that the director of the Minister of the Environment has the option to not grant an approval, rescind an approval or take approval back even if after one's been granted. So it means the government can reconsider projects already in the queue. They don't have to follow through with all of the wind power projects. There are just 55 of them in process right now. They do not have to follow through with all of them. There's 55 that are in process for to, to be signed or that are already signed? They have uh, fit contracts, but they are just in various stages of the approval process. So some are under appeal, some have gone through, gotten the total approval and they're being constructed. Whether any government would actually be able to get out of existing contracts is debatable. Ross McKittrick says it's possible. One option might be to buy out some of the uh, wind turbine companies and um, take those wind turbines off the grid or only use their power when they're competitive. In Europe, what governments have started to do though is put on special new taxes on renewable sources, solar and wind, to try to recover some of these costs. Um, alternatively, uh, the government may look at just trying to tear up the contracts and accept the legal liability that goes with it, but it's not going to be easy. Tom Adams says there's another way to stifle turbine development, to strengthen environmental laws. You know, so they're not allowed to chop up the birds. And when the tundra swans are flying up Highway 20, you know, from Sarnia to Tobermory, they're going to fly through this zone where there are literally going to be thousands of wind turbines. And those tundra swans are likely to be seriously impacted by all of this. If we were to shut down the wind turbines during the migration seasons when they go up and then come back through that area, somebody's going to be out a lot of money. You know, if those wind turbines are not generating, the, either the developer or the ratepayer is going to have to pay. And, you know, sorting out how that's all going to work is very tough country. The process is flawed. 
It isn't right to subject large numbers of community members to something we don't understand. It's not only a blight on the landscape, it's not only an insult to those who enjoy a rural landscape, it's an incursion on their psychological and physical well-being. Everybody counts. Everybody counts. Your life counts. Your family counts. Your home, your community, your future expectations, they all count. What happened to us, it, it's, it's not right, it's not just, and it shouldn't be happening to anybody else. There's certain things they can't take. They can't take your choices, your decisions of what you're going to do. They can't take your happiness. All people are looking for is their happiness. However, the green scam introduced right here at Queen's Park has been more than a failure, it's been a nightmare. Ontarians were sold on green energy, lower electricity bills, green jobs and cleaner air. However, prime farmland has been destroyed. Property values are tanking. Migratory birds are being killed. Local governments were stripped of their powers. Concerned citizens have been mobilizing. They're fighting tooth and nail. The Green Energy Act has cost Ontarians billions of dollars. It is unaffordable. Wind power is variable. It's intermittent. It's unreliable. And it's backed up by a fossil fuel. Skyscraper-sized wind turbines are a menace on people's health. Is it time to say stop? Is it time to fix what's gone terribly wrong? Is it time to turn wind down?